Emmaus friends and family, it's my privilege and honor to welcome our guest preacher and teacher this morning, the Reverend Dr. Raquel St. Clair Letsom. Reverend Raquel is a friend of the Emmaus community and a friend of mine. We are glad to welcome this scholar, author, teacher, lecturer, digital professor, coach, and consultant to our community of faith once and again. We send our love to her husband, Dr. Lydell Letsom, and to her two children, Tiffany Simone and Luke Charles. We are grateful for the word that she is bringing to the house. Hear ye her. Good morning, Emmaus. Today I draw your attention to a familiar portion of scripture found in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38, verses 46 through 47, where these words are found. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and wondered what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Verse 46 and 47. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For the next few moments, I want to preach from the subject, Reclaiming Our Peace. God is not done. For me, this in a nutshell is the message and meaning of Advent. Herein lies the hope of this season, because whether we are simply at the end of another year or find ourselves at the end of our proverbial rope, Advent reminds us of God's willingness to step in the midst of the human condition and the muck, mess, and mire of life to be God for us, God in us, God around us, the God who goes before us, all because God in the person of Jesus Christ decided to become Emmanuel the God who is with us. Throughout this year, we have seen that God is with us in the midst of a pandemic that has changed life as we know it, with us in the midst of political uncertainty that threatens the very fabric of our society, with us when people could not physically be around us and when problems got too big or too complicated for us, with us through the pain that threatened to break us when the plans we made crumbled before us, or we had to put to eternal rest people who loved us and we loved back. And although I, like many of you, regret that we all had to go through all that we had to get to this moment, the hope of Advent reminds me, encourages me, and persuades me to believe that this is not where we will stay. That God is up to something that we might not yet understand. God is moving in ways that we have yet to see. God is speaking to people and to situations that we have yet to learn about. That prophecy, proclamation, and confirmation are coming that we have yet to hear. Advent should give us hope, therefore cause us to yearn for a favorable future under the direction of God to expect that God will fulfill the promises that God has made in the past and to rest in these certainties that are not based on human frailty or finitude or faultiness, but rest firmly on the faithfulness of our God. And yet to have this kind of hope to find oneself living in the tension of the now and the not yet. In the reality of and surrounded by everything that looks like and feels like and sounds like a contradiction of what we are believing and hoping for. 
during this year. It has meant that some of us have lived in the isolation instead of the hope for love, companionship, and community. That we have lived with sickness instead of hope for health, with lack instead of hope for abundance, with fatigue and frustration instead of hope for respite and relief, for with chaos and confusion instead of hope for calm. It has defined ourselves in as contradictory times as the first advent. To hear John writing that true light has come into a world that is filled with so much darkness that people prefer darkness rather than light. Or of angels singing joy to the world when Judea was under Roman occupation and greater than 90% of the population lived in poverty. To hear wishes of peace on an earth when a people lived and were ruled by a militarized government and to hear goodwill to all humanity when Roman society rested on the backs of slaves that they captured and sold with impunity. Advent has always stood in the tension, the turmoil, and the stress of what is when what is is not what we want it to be and it pushes us to hope for what will be. So maybe, maybe that's why the theme of the second Sunday of Advent is peace. Because to live in the tension of Advent without losing hope requires peace. And so for lessons on reclaiming your peace, I offer to you, Mary, who lives peacefully in the tensions of her now and not yet. In painting, she is often depicted serenely, tranquilly, in spiritual repose. And yet her Advent story is as outrageous and as contradictory as they come. A pregnant virgin before in vitro fertilization existed, the father is God, and the fiancé doesn't even have a clue. Her Advent story has the makings of and parts of it actually have been made into a telenovela. And so the first lesson that Mary teaches us is that it's okay to be perplexed. That's how Luke describes her. Actually, he says she was much perplexed. And I'll admit that I don't like it, but I know that it's true, that hope that is rooted in who God is and what God says or shows often involves some level of cognitive dissonance. There's always some kind of disconnect because what is and what will be, where we are and where we're going, who we are and who we will become do not match. And as a matter of fact, we shouldn't want it to match because God is saying what will be in order to change for the better what currently is. I'm a witness that some of our peace is reclaimed when we stop trying to be a spiritual wonder in a super state, stop trying to twist the scripture around everything or to explain things for which there is no explanation and we have no real revelation. Stop trying to contain and explain life's complexities in Christian cliches. Humility ought to compel us to admit that sometimes we just don't understand and accept that we don't always understand why, don't always like why God does what God does, allows what God allows, moves when God decides to move or decides to do things the way God decides to do them. It is to accept that to live in obedience and submission to Almighty God will require an element of faith and to know that one can be faithfully perplexed and at peace because our confidence does not rest in our understanding or our intellect our experiences or our resources it rests with god the second thing that mary shows us is that it is holy to ponder everything doesn't require an immediate action on our part sometimes we just need to sit with stuff and not allow our perplexity to steal our peace by pushing us to panic Panic is a manifestation of our fear and the murderer of our peace. And often fear really is just an illusion. We are rarely afraid of what is, but what may be or become. Think about the thing that is scaring or stressing you right now. That thing that you're worrying about now and ask yourself, has it happened? Or is it just a possibility in the future? Because many of us are panicking over a what if and not a right now. And we are forfeiting right now peace as we panic over the future, a future that rests in the hands of God and will not be lived apart from God. So here sits Mary with an angel as a guest, a greeting she doesn't understand, a message that doesn't really make any sense. And she's given a task that will determine her role in salvation history, but may destroy her reputation in the process. Yet she doesn't panic. She ponders. Mary remains calm. She thinks it over. She contemplates it. She considers it. She doesn't rush to judgment, doubt, or fear. She stays in the present, 
and she ponders it. She asks how God is going to do it, and once she's even told the answer, even that doesn't make any sense, that the Holy Spirit's going to overshadow her and she'll conceive and bear a son. And pretty much Mary is given that girl, don't worry about it, God's got you kind of answer. And yet she doesn't raise objections or pose alternative scenarios or argue with the Lord. She embodies our next lesson by presenting herself to the Lord. Here I am, servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Peace comes in presenting oneself to the Lord, not running in the opposite direction, not pretending that everything is fine when it's not, not hiding or turning around and walking away. It comes by remaining present with the Lord in the midst of our perplexity as we wrestle and ponder, even when we find ourselves in the cold sweat of panic. So we reclaim our peace by being perplexed, pondering and panicked in the presence of the Lord until we are able to present ourselves to the Lord. Until we are able to surrender and submit ourselves as servants of the Most High God. That's what Mary refers to herself as, as the Lord's servant, literally as God's slave. She realizes that she's not in charge. She is inferior, the subordinate. And we all are when it comes to God. And yet the ironic thing is that we often play second fiddle to people, but then we want to go toe to toe with God. We're being run and moved and swayed and even being tormented by the opinions of others without any pushback. And meanwhile, some of us have been wrestling day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year over things that God is trying to work together for our good, plans that God has for our welfare and not our harm, all these things to be accomplished by a God who can bring everything to completion by the day of Christ Jesus and can do what is impossible for mortars, mortals. Because we really think that we are masters, masters of our own destiny, masterminds who can outfigure God, got a master's degree. And somehow we think that our perplexity and our pondering outweigh the power of God. Peace is reclaimed, my siblings, by a three-letter word, Y-E-S, that should be communicated in words and in actions and in attitude. Yes, Lord, when I get it, and yes, Lord, when I don't understand. Because God is not asking if we understand the plan. God is asking if we will obey the plan. God is not asking us to figure it out. God is asking us to follow the directions. And some of us will reclaim our peace when we quit making things so complicated and just do what we know God already said to do. And finally, Mary teaches us that praise reinforces peace. She says, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Mary magnifies and rejoices during her now before Jesus is born, before people she finds out how people are going to react, before she knows how Joseph is going to respond, before she can even figure out how to rear and care for and provide for this child. Mary makes up her mind that she is going to magnify the Lord. And maybe that's why she does it. She doesn't make God big. She increases and magnifies her estimation of who God is so that she sees that God is bigger than any question, confusion, conflict, opposition, or opinion that may come her way. As a matter of fact, Mary begins to make God so big that God is bigger than the biggest and most powerful person that she knows, Caesar Augustus, who in a few months will decree a census that will take she and Joseph to Bethlehem where Jesus is born. So often as Christians, we think that Savior was a title that began with Jesus. But Caesar was deified and declared Savior. Caesar was the one they claimed ushered in peace to the world through the Pax Romana. But Mary's praise was a recognition that there is one who sits higher than any political ruler, one who is more powerful than any army on earth, one who saves by grace through faith, one who conquers by means of love. Mary magnified the Lord, and when she magnified the Lord, it made Caesar smaller, so small that his title no longer fit him and his accolades had to be given to somebody greater. Can I tell you that when we praise God, our problems and other people and the things that we come up against becomes puny in the presence of God. 
We don't have to jump a pew. An organ chord doesn't have to be played. Preachers don't have to be in a pulpit. We just have to change our perspective. Our estimation of God has to become so big that it trumps what is going on around us and inside of us. That is the wisdom that we see of Mary. She's caught in a now that defies reason, waiting for a not yet that she's struggling to understand. And Mary, mother of Jesus, Mary, descendant of the motherland, embraces a Sankofa spirituality. She goes back and gets what she needs in order to go forward. Her praise and her peace comes from what God has already done, which is why when you read the Magnificat, you will see that the acts of God are written in the past tense. Mary magnifies God because God has shown mercy and strength, scattered the proud, brought down the powerful, lifted up the lowly, filled the hungry with good things, and helped his servant Israel. Watch what Mary is doing. She is connecting what God has done to what she needs God to do. In her position, she needs God to show mercy and strength while she is perplexed and pondering. She needs God to scatter the proud who will pass judgment on her. She needs God to lift up the lowly because she is poor and female and single and pregnant. And she needs to know that God can fill the hungry with good things because of Joseph backs out. She needs to know that God can and God will supply. She needs to know that God helps God's servants because that is what she has claimed to be. And so in her praise, Mary builds a bridge between her now and her not yet so that she can find some peace until she is able to cross over. And beloved, I'm encouraging you on this Advent Sunday to build yourself a bridge by remembering what God has done to allow you to have made it this far along the way, as bruised, as broken, and as burdened as you may be right now, to expand your estimation of God until a pandemic cannot overtake your praise. The White House can't make you forget that God is worthy. Your ego won't get in the way of God's glory. And disappointment can't take away your devotion. And Satan can't have your song. Until you can testify like the hymn writer said, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. <laughs> Go ahead and be perplexed. Know that it's holy for you to ponder. Do it all in the presence of the Lord until you can present yourself as a servant of the Lord. And then you grab yourself a praise and build a bridge of peace till God gets you to the other side.